so I want to introduce more important people right now because this is Lisa and Stuart. And before they come up, I just want to tell you, so Lisa and Stuart, um, they used to run a business called Endless Recycling Metals. And they came to me for a couple of reasons. They were having some issues around the business growing really fast and the wheels kind of falling off. And they were also having some challenges because they're a husband and wife. So Lisa and Stuart are both business partners and they're married. And so they came, we had a chat, um, thanks to my friend Daniel who introduced us, and they started implementing EOS in their business. So I'm going to ask them to actually share that story first of all. And then I want you to just ask some questions because they have answers, real life answers that, that they can actually provide. So welcome up Stuart and Lisa. Hi everyone, I'm Lisa and um, yeah, I, my background um, was in management consulting for many years. And then I moved to New Zealand and I became an accidental entrepreneur because my visionary over here wanted to sort of go out on his own and um, somebody had to keep him in check. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, yeah, that's a, bit of, a little bit about me. And this is Stu, who will have no problem telling you all about himself. <laughs> so, um, yes, thank you. That's very kind. Um, in, we came from South Africa. We arrived here seven years ago. And in South Africa, I ran the largest metal recycling company in sub-Saharan Africa. So my experience was in recycling for now, probably for the previous 25 years. So when we arrived here, um, we were looking for the opportunity of what we were going to do. And I said to, to Lisa that I think there's an opportunity to do it better. There was a monopoly in New Zealand and they controlled the prices. And we could see that there was an opportunity to incentivize people to recycle more by increasing the prices, therefore getting more people to, to recycle their metal. Um, I went over and this maybe just sums us up a little bit and I said, let's put all any money that we have into this. It's a great idea. I've got a gut feeling for it. Lisa said, absolutely not. She spent a month or two doing a 75 page business plan and then said, okay, I now believe you. Now we can put some money into it. It looks like there's an opportunity. So um, yeah, I jump off the cliff and Lisa builds airplane on the way down. <laughs> yeah, that's pretty much how it's been. So you came across EOS because you're part of YPO? Yeah. Um, and I think it was um, Daniel who talked to you about it originally. So, yeah, yeah what, tell us the story about how you came across it and why you decided to go with it. Yeah, Daniel, awesome guy. He introduced us to you, and we're very thankful for that. Um, I had nothing to do with going to EOS. <laughs> Absolutely nothing. I just listened to my wife, and um, she's very wife, smart. <laughs> so uh, I knew to, to um, toe the line. And it was, it was incredible that we did it. And I was probably kicking and screaming in the beginning because we don't need any structure. I'm just, I just, you know, do whatever I feel like at the time. And, um, and she said, no, we absolutely need structure. And when we brought the structure in, I was probably the one, you know, celebrating the most after the first month. Just the actual goals that we were kicking were, was chalk and cheese compared to where we were before. I think if we go back to our meeting with Daniel, the first night we met Daniel, it was when we had just joined YPO, we were at an event, and after chatting to us for all of five minutes, oh, right. he said, visionary integrator, you yeah. know? and we were like, what? Um, and we were quite curious, and um, that's when he started talking a bit about EOS, and we've obviously got a lot of respect for Daniel, he's um, a very successful um, entrepreneur, I mean, entrepreneur CEO, and... Um, Anyway, when we were having some trouble in our business, just feeling like, the, like Deb said, the wheels are coming off, um, we actually turned to Daniel and we said, listen, you know, you've run all these big companies. Um, can we just have a, a chat with you and maybe you've got some, some wisdom to share with us? And in that chat, he, he said to us, you know, <laughs> a classic case for EOS. This is what you guys need. There's nothing in it for me. Um, just, yeah, um, read the books. And um, if you want to chat to Deb, you can, um, you know, sort of no strings attached. And, you know, I had to drag Stuart, I think, yeah. to that meeting <laughs> for sure. uh, where we spoke to Deb, who walked out there and he's like, oh, everything sounds amazing when someone's trying to sell you something. <laughs> mm, yeah, exactly. I'm like, you even sit in the meeting. We can implement it ourselves and we could. You take the How much is this going to cost? Is <laughs> yeah, it worthwhile? Yeah. <laughs> Heard um, the story all before. Yeah, yeah so um, I did read all the books that Deb gave me. And I just thought this makes a lot of sense, you know. Um, and, and some of the books I'd read previously in, in my career, like Good to Great by Jim Collins, which is just a, a management classic. And yeah, it just made sense. I mean, you wouldn't run a business if you've got inventory without an ERP system, and you wouldn't run a business without an accounting system. And, you know, people are um, our greatest asset in a business. So why would you then run a business without a management operating system? So, yeah. You should get into it. sales. <laughs> you should do sales for Deborah, maybe. If only I wasn't so introverted. <laughs> <laughs> so, guys, looking at the, the EOS model, which of those component parts did you find most difficult to pull oh. off? 
most that's difficult. I thought you were going to say uh, most that's, beneficial. Yeah. Well, either, um, either way. Oh, no, no, no. It's unfair well, yeah, for me to ask the question here, right? Um, most difficult. I think something that took us a really long time was the scorecard because everybody's wearing their own hat. So, of course, marketing thinks that their um, sort of KPIs are the most important KPIs, and so does finance, mm. and so does HR, and so does health and safety. And to whittle that list down actually took us a really long time to distill it to what really matters, what is really going to turn the dial. And, um, yeah, that took us a good couple of weeks, whereas a lot of the other stuff, um, you know, we came and we did the planning and we, we you know, I did the vision, day, vision building days and, you know, you've got the tools and you can just run with them. Um, but that one, I think, is quite subjective in a lot of ways, you know, like the level 10 meeting, set agenda, set amount of time. Can't really go wrong unless you've got people who are complete, like, mm. deviants. Um, but, but, yeah, so I think that was quite challenging. <laughs> um, I found probably the rocks in the beginning. So setting everything those rock, rock, everything, <laughs> right? It was like, must come to work every day. It was, oh, that's a rock. It's, I've got to, yes, I did that. You know, it was like, and everybody wanted to make sure, you know, all the different members in the SLT wanted to make sure that they hit their rocks. So the way that they all defined their rocks was, um, was, wasn't right early on. But we went through that whole process. And then when we met with Deborah after that, it was like, well, you guys didn't hit your rocks because you got it all wrong or you hit those because they were too easy. And then we kind of sat down with them and said, well, what? Let's go through it. And I think the whole process was actually quite clever of you're going to get it wrong in the first quarter. And she wanted us to. And then we could oh, sit. I'm not sure I wanted you to, but I wanted you to do what you wanted to do. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Or well, you wanted us to go through an experience where we then we learned a hell of a lot from that first quarter. Um, but the rocks. So then to, to answer my question, which was what I found really beneficial. Um, the rocks were incredible. So as the visionary, um, having that, so, so having the level 10 meeting and the rocks was the weekly meeting where I find out if everybody's on track or not. Mm. It, it's so simple and it's, yes, I'm on track, no, I'm off track. Straight away, IDS, you're off track because we as a team want to deal with why you're off track. You could be off track halfway through the quarter and we can all band together and work out how we get you to achieve that. Whereas, Previously, before EOS, there was no um, ability for somebody to bring up that they were struggling other than just walking into my office and having random conversations, but you weren't having it with the rest of the team, right? We were having meetings for meetings sakes. We were constantly in meetings and the meetings, and then it talks about the IDS, how often those meetings were just the first hour or hour and a half were on things that weren't as important as what the one person wanted to talk about, but they might be an introvert and they don't necessarily want to speak up. But now in, in the level 10 meeting, they're forced to because you go around in a circle. And it's like, well, how are you on your rocks? And you can't just say, yeah, on track. And then you get the end of the quarter and, oh, oops, I didn't hit it. So there were just so many good things. So I know that wasn't necessarily your no, second part of your question, but yeah, yeah, that was helpful. I think another challenge there was also um, we just had too many rocks. The first couple of yeah. um, quarters, we really did. And it's, it's just showed us that we were just trying to do too much. Yes. Um, and yeah, so over time we gave people less and less rocks and they started hitting all their rocks. Yeah. yeah. Okay. And it doesn't mean that you weren't getting the, the productivity though, does it? So because people go, if you're doing less rocks, what does that really mean? Well, I think they weren't completing the rocks in the allotted mm. time. Yeah. And then that yeah. was, pro I, think in one, I think I had eight rocks the one time and you did warn us. You were like, you can't have eight rocks. And she and I were like, no, we can have eight rocks. Mm. We're fine with eight rocks, you know? <laughs> and you just can't, you know, unless you can sort of clone yourself. It's just too much, you know? Mm. If everything's important, then nothing's important. I remember the one of the the biggest discussions we had, um, I can't remember if it was around rocks or our annual kind of targets that we had set. And I'm very different to Lisa. So I like setting myself a BHAG, which I'm probably not going to achieve, right? A big, hairy, audacious goal. And I'm probably, but if I get to 90% of it, that's way better than we were doing or that we thought we could even do. Whereas Lisa was like, no, you can't do that. It has to be something that is achievable. So when we hit, when we set these annual targets, and I think was it the five year, and we even go ten year, yeah. when you we were writing those down, people thought I was absolutely crazy, right? I'm expecting this company to be the fastest growing business in New Zealand, which we were two years ago. So all of these sort of things that we were hoping to achieve sounded crazy, and there was a lot of back and forth around the table about no, 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 that's too much. And I'm going, well, if for example we aren't the number one growing company in three years' time, if we come second or third. 
it's still a great achievement. And Lisa was, no, 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 it's got to be achievable. Otherwise, people don't feel that they've actually hit their target. So there was, there was a lot of that back and forth at, at one stage, which was quite interesting for me because I came she from a different... She goes must have a great marriage. <laughs> uh, yeah, she punches me a lot. <laughs> Somebody said the other day, actually, at least she didn't punch. I was like, yeah, she punches me. <laughs> And I think this, this comes back to the scorecard. I mean, I often, because um, so visionaries, because I'm a visionary too, we don't mind if we don't hit our things. We kind of go, mm. well, we've got most of the way there. That's pretty cool. Absolutely. But for a lot of people, if you don't hit it, they feel like they've failed. Mm. And that's the important part. This needs to actually make them encouraged. So even with your scorecard, which you update every 90 days, you actually need to, if you don't, if you've got a really big hairy audacious goal for your sales, don't put it in there as a number. Put an achievable number that's stretching them, but it's achievable. Let them get a couple of greens and then push it up. And you can keep pushing that up every two or three weeks if you want to but let them get some greens and move it up rather than just relying on them to you know get the really big number which they'll never get and then they'll get disheartened because they're like well we're never going to get there it's always mm. red yeah? yeah but the problem as a visionary you often have like this toxic positivity of this like delusional <laughs> optimism where you're like well we actually will get there and they're like no well, we can't I'm like why can't we like we've got three years and we can go hire another 250 people and get to the numbers they want it. and everybody sits around going like oh my god this is scary yeah. So, uh, yeah, luckily, my integrator calms me down before the meetings and makes sure that we're kind of aligned beforehand. Yeah, um, Lisa, I'd love for you to share around the relationships internally, but obviously with you being a married couple as well, mm. how has understanding the visionary and the integrator role and also the communications, how has it affected your marriage as well? It's been really good for us because before I just thought Stu was an animal and <laughs> now I realize he's a very specific type of animal and it's, it's a thing, it's not, it's not a Stu well, thing, it's a thing recording, thing. Eh? This is awkward. <laughs> <laughs> and um, yeah, you know, I used to find him quite frustrating and at times infuriating because there was this shiny thing and that shiny thing and let's do all the things and um, you know, just like excited and optimistic about everything. And here I was like calculating in my head, okay, but we only have this many resources and this amount of time. And if we do this and we can't do that. And yeah, it was actually became a big point of tension between the two of us. But once I was like, okay, he's a visionary. This is a thing. And I'm an integrator. This is a thing. Um, it just kind of um, created that space for us to engage in that way. And yeah, we did, there were some really tough times, especially before then, before, being a married sure. couple and working together because... Unfortunately, when you don't have these um, labels, things can feel personal, you know, um, or he's just not listening to me, whereas now it's like, oh, he's being a visionary again, you know? <laughs> yeah, the definition was really helpful for our marriage, but I think even the relationships in business, right? So I think when you're a CEO and a CEO or whatever the other role could be, um, I think just knowing that that's how that person is, mm -hmm. that that, and, and there's actually a lot of value in that, right? There's a lot of value in that. It is. It's a recording as well. <laughs> But um, th that is important, and, but this is their personality, and that's why they'll do that. And we couldn't be here without that, yep. and I couldn't be here without that. And, and once you get that right, oh man, it well, was amazing. What about wider into the team? So the, the communication in um, having the level 10 meetings, and uh, the, I often find there's a cultural shift in behavior. Um, did you notice that within, within your leadership team? Yeah, well, we would have a lot of meetings. Those meetings would often start late. Everyone wasn't there on time. Um, they would go on forever. On there phones. was no agenda. Everyone's on their phone. Um, people would just, whoever was the loudest or, or spoke first, got, you know, sort of um, took over that whole meeting. And it was just so unproductive. Like, I actually got to a stage where I was hating going to work. I was just like, every, we're just like moving things around. Like, we're not making progress. And um, everybody feels like, no, but we need to meet about this thing. And actually, what I love about IDS is that if you leave someone to solve a problem, very often they actually will. But if there's all these meetings, they feel the need to, I feel like, hoard their problem so they can come to the meeting and say, you know, I've been doing this thing and I'm struggling here and I need your help and, and all these things. And really, if you say, listen, is this one of the most important things to solve for the company right now? No. Okay. Can you find a way? People find a way, you know. So I think a lot of the things that landed up on our desk, um, they started being fewer and fewer and fewer mm. things hitting our desk because people felt empowered because... I don't know, maybe their, their stance was, I better take this to the meeting and, and maybe not feeling empowered to just go solve things, you know? I don't know. Yeah, very much so. Yeah, people felt that they needed to get approval on things, whereas when the IDS was kind of just done and dusted. Also, I really liked the way the level 10s could cascade down. 
right? So then you go, you have your SLT, your senior leadership team, and then you would um, have, we had an operations team, you know, we'd have a sales team, and everybody was doing their own one as well, which wouldn't necessarily be the same amount of time. It might be a smaller group. Um, we also had our, our yard team that did one, but they were a much bigger group. So they had a different version of it um, where they would kind of go around a circle and have discussions. So I really like the way that you can carry on that um, structure all the way through the company. And the cascading messages, I guess. Messages so well. we had a big communication problem um, because we knew what was going on maybe in our department or you know at the top or wherever it was, but to actually tell other people in the organization that something's moved and we're now going in another direction or this project's cancelled or, or things like that, with the cascading messages, you then have the ability to actually go away from the meeting and you've got those action items. Okay, tell these people these things. Just give them a little update and say, hey, this is what was discussed. This project's actually on hold. This is why... And we're now focusing on this, by the way, new hire in that department, go say hi, et cetera. Mm. And so communication is like such a natural human thing. But I think the, the bigger you get, when we started, I mean, it was just you, me, and one other person. Mm. That was very easy. I don't remember what that thing you showed us is. It's actually a, yeah, what's it called? It, um, with the little people. It's like a very quick like, show yeah, you. Yeah. So I mean, <laughs> you start the business, if you think about it. So basically, in the beginning of the business, there was Stuart. And there was Lisa, can't remember for a while. And so communication was pretty easy, right? I mean, well, in the beginning, it's actually just one person. Yeah, you communicate yeah. with yourself, it's easy. Mm -hmm. When you've got two people, you've suddenly got 100% increased communication. Add an extra person in here, and all of a sudden, you've got to communicate that way, that way, and that way. That's actually sort of 200% uh, mm -hmm. more communication. Add a fourth person in, and it actually becomes 500% more communication that you have to do as that, as that grows. Now, you can model that out, and as you get bigger and bigger and bigger as an organisation, that level of communication is huge. How do you make, keep control of that? Yeah. Mm. And it was so good for culture, the cascading message, mm. because what we found was, so say, for example, you know, the third guy that would join the company was really close to me, but he worked in the yard and became our yard supervisor. And within two to three years, there were three people in between him or two people in between him. Right? We had a senior leadership team and he was reporting to different people. And that guy, as an example, would get really frustrated if we hired somebody new and I hadn't personally told him that, hey, there's such and such who's now, might not report to him, not, they have nothing to do with him, but he felt that there was um, the personal relationship and therefore he should be told everything that happens. And then you'd get, you know, your whole second layer at a stage where then when you grow, there becomes a layer in between and that communication wasn't going. So the cascading messages, which we would say in the, in the SLT level 10, where this needs to be pushed down. Everybody, everybody was getting told any changes in the company as it was happening. So these are the new hires, we're pivoting into waste, we're moving into catalytic converted, whatever it might be. Everybody knew what was happening because they had a weekly meeting and they were told what decisions were being made by the leadership team and everybody kind of felt very comfortable. They didn't find out about it on Facebook or something like that. And I think what's really important, because you, you have a lot of blue collar workers working out in the yard and whatnot, you know, the level 10 meeting at that level can actually be even more simplified. It can literally be what's working, yeah. what's not working, and then do an IDS session, and that is it. So it could be, and, I, and not pure EOS, but I've got teams who do daily huddles, and they literally just go, what's working, what's not working, IDS. Don't tell me about your work in progress, I'm not interested mm. in that, I want to know where you're stuck, and how I can help, and how we can IDS it together. That's exactly it. That's what and, we did with the, the toolbox S, talks. The S is so important in IDS, because actually, we got to a point where we having meetings where everyone's giving updates. That's lovely to hear what everyone's up to, but like, the what's the point? Yeah, like, yeah. What if we, we literally would go around and people would say, oh, I've been busy with this and this happened and da, 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 and okay, next, right? Like, actually thinking, like, what was the point of those meetings? So, mm. You know, it was just a box ticking exercise. Yeah, before you're saying before yeah, level yeah. 10. Yeah. And just asking that why and why and why mm. to get mm -hmm. to what the actual problem is, you know? It seems like an obvious, simple thing, but often you're solving the symptom, not the problem. And so... Yeah, that's also a really neat trick. How, um, how long ago did you guys implement this? And then how long did it take before you felt like, oh yeah, it actually feels like it's sinking in? Well, we exited in January, so now I've got to try and work back from there. Um, Was it two probably years? the last two yeah. years. We probably operated for the last years. So the company had been going now for just under six years. So um, we, probably, we probably worked with it for two and a half years, I would say probably two and a half years and I would say 
from day one, from the first level 10 meeting, although it's a little bit iffy, nobody's quite sure, you know, you've got your integrator saying, this is what this part of the agenda is. And although we've all been, because the whole senior leadership team came with Deborah for the explanation, when you're actually doing it in practice, the first time actually Deborah's with you, which was really helpful, so, so she runs you through it. But then when you kind of left to do it by yourself, it's a little bit funny to get through. People aren't sure, that, can I talk about this now? No, 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 wait, they must wait for later. You know, you get kind of put in your place quite nicely. Um, so I'd say within the first month, you start to feel, you know, definitely um, there's some impact happening. And whether it's, you know, you've created your rocks and people are now focusing on what the company needs to move forward, not just what they feel might be important at the time. You know, those sort of things we felt within the first month. Yeah. Was, was there anyone in that process who didn't get on board straight away and how did you deal with that? We had some funny issues. The best one, and I say best because it was absolutely ludicrous, um, our head of finance, when we did our, what's the name? Accountability chart. Yeah. Thank you, guys. Um, <laughs> when was the, do you want it? He said no. <laughs> so we're like, well, ho when we went around, it was like the first meeting. We were yeah. off-site. And we're like, what do, you, what do you mean you don't want it? He's like, I actually don't want to do finance. <laughs> so, but that's what you, you literally put into a role. For, we had to like, re this was like a, it was probably awkward for you even. Like, I'm not quite sure <laughs> how we deal with the situation. You don't want to do the job you're hired to do. Right, that was quite. That was quite. And that weird. wasn't a simple switch. That I heard you talking earlier about marketing sales. And yeah, like, yeah, that was quite difficult because we didn't have <laughs> anybody. Skills, yeah, yeah. Um, and then I, I would say he probably was somebody that would miss a few meetings, um, and other people would see that, and that became a bit of an issue. Um, other people was, was Simon ever in that? No, no I don't no, think no. he was. We actually picked a couple of wrong people by going through the process. Yeah. Oh, but we actually had our first couple of sessions actually outdoors. It was in the middle of COVID and we couldn't get together. Yeah, yeah that's what I was thinking outdoors. about. We yeah. had HR switch yeah. over to health and well, safety. That's right. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And then we had somebody yeah. who came on as a yard manager who ended up not, well, not well, operations, but ended up not really getting, yeah. wanting it, having the capacity yeah, to do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. yeah. Moved into he, sales. He quite quickly, yeah. Mm, oh, no, and then we had yeah. the other one who moved from ops into sales. Yeah. But to answer your question, um, I think almost everybody bought in, um, except for one person, right? Um, everybody else bought in and they liked the structure. I think they were frustrated with me probably because I didn't bring structure and I didn't believe in structure. So they loved the idea of what I actually hold on, this is going to keep Stuart in check. Um, <laughs> and, and it did because also because I absolutely loved it once it was going. Yeah. I um, think the only person who didn't get on board was the person who didn't want to be hold, held accountable for anything. And it was really good to actually see that in black and white. Yeah. So, yeah, you can. And, and yeah, yeah you, you see it very quickly. Is that person but, still around? Um, we've exited the yeah. company, so, yeah. so he is still there. Yeah. But um, that was a separate issue um, with him. <laughs> but yeah, he is still there. There's always um, challenges of multiple shareholders. Yeah. Yeah. But yeah, so um, um, absolutely, the um, the if they get it, they they come on board, and the people that are kind of um, not so interested to follow the the rules are probably the ones that you, you want to look at quite carefully. It's not onerous, right? You're not asking much of people. Um, so if they're really resistant to it, you've got to ask why. Yeah. You know, what, yeah. what are they losing by doing this? You know, they're getting back heaps of time. Um, they, they, if they weren't feeling empowered before, they're definitely feeling empowered afterwards. Everyone's being held accountable, so they can't complain that people they're relying on aren't doing what they're supposed to. Like, where's the downside? Why would one not get on board, really, mm. you know? And it creates an incredible accountability. Mm. It really does. So if you if somebody's pulling away from it, it's because they don't want to be held accountable. And we, I think, we could find a see it uh, kind of see it on um, often like salespeople that don't necessarily want to give you their KPIs or, or be managed in that way. They like to just go out for lunches. Right? You can kind of see that. Hold on, you bring this in. They're like, hold on, I I don't want to have to report on rocks. You know, you have my KPIs that I like to do. Um, but that makes them put them in a setting like this with five other, you know, co-workers or people at their level. And they, it's, it's very obvious when you're not the one hitting your rocks every time, right? It's, it's highlights we have an issue in that seat and nobody likes to be that issue. So, yeah. I mean, we had an interesting time when we actually had data from our um, IVR system about phone calls and what was happening. And we literally had, had an argument with a sales guy because we were like, yeah. this is what the data is showing. He's like, no, the data doesn't mean anything. We're yeah. like... What do you mean the day? He's like, yeah. like he was talking about missing phone calls. 
he was, the, I think it was the sales guy and he was saying he that. Answer, he missed that up to 90% of his phone calls. And whenever we put phone calls through to him, he wasn't answering it. And he literally, his words were that data doesn't mean anything. When we were saying, you're not on to look, 90% of your calls you missed, here is it, data doesn't mean anything. So he didn't last <laughs> at all. <coughs> Any other questions? By the way, just, just for um, these guys, but I mean, they actually, you won the Westpac Awards for a number of different things, didn't you, after sort of um, turning that business off? Yeah, last year we won, um, well, we won Best Emerging Business, we won Strategy and Planning, we won Export. We won a few others, and then we customer won service, customer service. And then we won last year. We won an um, overall supreme, supreme winner. Award, yeah. Yeah. yeah, so it was quite cool. Perfect. Congratulations. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah. We didn't enter the Deloitte Fast Fifty because of her, and uh, we would have won that as the fastest growing business. So we could see the numbers, and when you are, but we had so much going on at the time. Lisa was like, I, I can't write another. And here's just a, a tip which has nothing to do with EOS. <laughs> I was always like, there's no point in entering. Mm. We're never going to win. Like it's a waste of time. And every time he would literally, because I would write the entries, he would force me to enter. So, so if you're Chat ever GPT. thinking about... <laughs> before you know, ChatGPT, like we actually wrote if the If you're entries. ever thinking about entering <laughs> things like the Westpac Awards, I think they're now the two degrees, or I'm not sure. But um, anyway, do it. It's so worthwhile. Um, and it's something I would never have done if you didn't yeah. push me to do. And feel yeah. free, I'm, I'm serious, we kind of, we love to collaborate. And, um, feel free to reach out to us at any time. You can find us on LinkedIn, whatever just to give you some tips and advice and introduce you to one or two people if you want. But yeah, you get amazing exposure. You get to really, um, the social media exposure is good if that's what you want for your business. But um, yeah, I think it's, it, was, it was amazing for our business. But she never believed we would ever win anything and I we ended do. up winning it all. So <laughs> it's a great... Yeah, exactly. <laughs> and it's an amazing um, culture builder for your team more than anything. Those evenings mm. are amazing. Everybody gets to dress up really nice and they drink their champagne and everybody has a lot of fun. And then when you do go up, that, that sense of belonging, which I find is the number one thing for any culture, um, that sense of belonging, it just goes through the roof. There's just one thing that I'm just going to stand close to your microphone. Um, one of the things that, the reason I fell in love with EOS was they actually asked me. <laughs> um, they launched into New Zealand using my event centre in Parnell, and that's how I actually came across it. And the one thing, I'd, I've been coaching for, I think, close to 15 years. I've been running businesses for 30 years. And the one thing I loved about it was actually the process that we go through. So you said you got results from the first kind of level 10 meeting. And that's because in our first day together, we don't do the vision, the strategy, the big picture, because we kind of go, you've already got that. You're running a business you kind of know what you're doing the first day is focus on teaching those tools do you have a scorecard do you have rocks how do you run a level 10 meeting how do you get all the team on board in terms of where we're headed and then you go away for 30 days and you actually get to run that stuff in your business see how it works and then we come back and only then do we actually go into the uh, the eight questions and answering the eight questions and I think that's why you start to even though you don't get immediate results from a financial um, you know revenue point of view you get immediate results in terms of the focus of the people mm, and accountability Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So that's the part yeah, of the reason I fell in love with it. Yeah. Okay. Um, I've got the, another yeah, question. Actually. Go. Uh, how much of this would you say you'll implement it? Like, is there parts of it that you're like, mm, not quite for us, we'll park it, or are you kind of like 100% on all of it? Um, I don't, uh, if I'm looking there, um, yeah, we did actually implement all of it. There were probably some tools that we didn't get to using. Um, to be fair, I can't name which ones they are, but there's a whole yeah. big toolkit and I don't think we use each and every tool just because it's a process, right? It's an ongoing thing. You get comfortable with something, you incorporate it, everyone becomes familiar with it. Um, but not because we sort of rejected any of them. I think given more time, there's no, no reason why, why we wouldn't have, I guess. Um, and it's quite interesting because um, lately I've been attending um, a bunch of webinars or being spe speaking to people in the States and EOS is actually a massive thing globally and just the concept of management operating systems. And I couldn't believe how many people, um, you know, I went to a webinar by a woman who, who runs a VC. She's a, a, a partner in a VC and um, she was talking about how she insists on all her portfolio companies using EOS. And um, it's just something that people were throwing out there as if everybody knew about it, you know. And um, it just makes me wonder, like, are we in New Zealand a little bit behind when it comes to sort of um, management practices? And are we just kind of freestyling? Um, you know, management is, it's an art and it's a science. And, you know, the sort of um, workforce is changing in so many ways and so rapidly, you know, from work from home, from, you know, AI and the augmented employee and just the future of work is, it's very different and it's changing rapidly. And so, 
you know, if, if sort of human capital and, and how you're managing to get the best out of people, to retain people, um, isn't sort of top of mind, you know, what are we doing? And, and I don't know if, if you've got a view as to why um, in New Zealand it's not as common a practice, just management operating systems as, you know, a thing. Yeah. yeah. I, I think it probably comes, this is my personal experience, I think it comes down to some of the number eight went by mentality. And I think in answer, to answer the questions, like if you try to do just bits of EOS, it actually won't work. You've got to embrace the whole thing. And the reason you didn't get some of the tools, like there are, there are the foundational tools, they're the foundational tools. If you just put those in place, mm. that will make a difference to your business. Yeah. Then there's extra tools in the toolbox. There's 20 um, additional kind of tools, or 20 tools in, the, in that toolbox. And then there's some more tools around, like if you want to merge and acquire, we've got tools that can help you with mergers and acquisitions because that's a bit like getting married. You want to make the right decision about those things. And so unfortunately, what New Zealanders tend to do is they kind of go, well, I quite like that, but I'll just change that a wee bit, or I'll do a little bit of this, a little bit of that. And in reality, you know, this has been around for 23 years, 190,000 people businesses using it, you actually have to implement pure EOS to get the true results from it. And I, I don't know if that is part of the reason. And probably just an awareness thing. I mean, I, um, I wasn't aware of it no, until, yeah. you know, sort of Daniel mentioned it to us. So, yeah. I don't know if this is um, maybe off topic slightly, but has anybody seen um, Super Pumped or We Crashed? Yeah. Right. So there's, there's a time for an entrepreneur to be running a company and there's a time for them to have a lot of structure. And I think you see it in a lot of companies, um, unicorns that where the entrepreneur and I, I was this person jumping in, jumping off the cliff, building an airplane, but I don't want to fly the airplane. Like there's a time for the entrepreneur to be in there and then they need structure. And I think at an early stage, it's probably not necessarily EOS, right? Because you, they're just jumping off the cliff and they're doing whatever they need to very, very early on. I'm talking about ideation, creation, right? But then when that plane is flying where we were, if I didn't have Lisa, we would have crashed four years ago, right? Because I was all over the place. I was constantly looking at that trajectory and going, we must continually grow at this speed. But while building that airplane, the engine was falling out, right? Everything behind me was falling, but I was looking at the next shiny thing. So um, I think, I don't know if it's got to do with entrepreneurs often just wanting to keep control themselves and not necessarily believing that they need structure, and that might be a, a, a Kiwi thing or not, but I think in general, it's quite hard. Like, I wouldn't have done it if it wasn't my wife who told me to go and do it, right? It's quite hard for the visionary to actually say, yeah, yeah that's brilliant, that's just what we need right now. Somebody to bring in structure and control me. And I do be and I do believe after the first session, I said, what did you think of that? And you were like, I was so bored, this is the worst. <laughs> <laughs> like, I would never have said, said that, come on. Was like, <laughs> I was just eating the chocolates, trying to get sugar rush. <laughs> I'm like, ah, keep me awake. <laughs> And then we There's a lot of gave, theory. Yeah, There's a and lot then of we theory. actually gave Stu a Kindle and we gave him some of the books and he started reading it in his own time and yeah. listened to them and then it sort of changed. So it is challenging, right? Because I'm a visionary too. And it's challenging to suddenly have everything that you do challenged a wee bit. Mm. But if you can just take mm. it from the point of view, you have got that box there, which you are really, really good at. That is your unique ability. And if you could spend all your time just doing that, imagine what could happen to the business. Because then you've got these other people in their boxes doing their unique ability and they're just taking the business along and you mm. can do what you actually really love. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Okay, any other questions? Just an observation that, that Stu, the, the, that compartmentalization between the visionary and the mm. integrator, I experienced yesterday in a board meeting of explaining to the visionary what the role is and identifying and articulating the functions that he has to carry out. Yeah. And then suggesting to him that the reason why he gets frustrated is because he hasn't recognised what his role is. Well, this guy's been a founder for 23 years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You know, so to the extent that even talking about the functions that are to be carried out independently mm. seem to uh, resonate and Absolutely. settle an awful lot of the, and lead it to the, we're going to have a 90 yeah. minute sesh with Deborah. Sure. Yeah, brilliant. Yeah. Because that's, I think just that definition, you yes. spoke about it right in the yeah. beginning. When we were given that definition, yes. everything just made sense. Yes. It's like, and, and all of a sudden, I appreciated Lisa's role and I believe she appreciated mine. Yeah. But before then, oh, we frustrated each yeah. other yeah. completely, yeah. right? It's I like, why are you chasing those? Stop trying things? to slow me down all the time. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's exactly well, it. Do you understand what I'm saying? Absolutely. Like, yeah. can't you see yeah. the benefit of, you know, going to the moon tomorrow? Yeah. Like, yeah. we can do that. Yeah. So, yeah. yeah. 
And the rocket fuel book is actually the book that sort of talks to that. I think yep. it's quite a unique EOS thing of all the different models that I've looked at. The, that visionary role is, is, is talked about in rocket fuel and it really is. Yep. It don't see it as a negative. It's like, actually, imagine if, if you put those five bullet points there, you know, big relationships, big ideas, mm. uh, research and development, industry knowledge and culture. Mm. Most people would go, I love that stuff. Great. Mm. You go do that 100% of your time. Yeah. Imagine yeah. the value that's going to add to the business rather than you getting caught up in all this stuff, which yeah. is flying the plane, which none of us want to do. Absolutely. And it's interesting, Stu had a friend um, who had a, a small business and he was struggling to grow it. And Stu had a conversation with him and he, you know, established this guy as the visionary. And he said, what are you doing messing around with, you know, all these things? Go do the big relationships, go do the sales, go do all these mm. things. And his business has grown Absolutely. so much over the past few years, just from that, like one conversation and that realization that he was focusing on all the wrong things. Yeah. Yeah, completely. Perfect. Okay, final words from you two, and then I'm actually going to um, get Craig up here because he's got a different perspective as well. But um, what would you say? I mean, you, you're now both starting new businesses as well. How 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 is EOS featuring in those? <laughs> um, I was actually thinking when I was sitting there listening, I was being reminded of all these tools, right? Because yeah. we hadn't been in it for a little while, and and we hadn't done the training even longer. Um, and I was thinking, I actually can't wait to be in the position to have the team to come back into this room and have the team understand. Because I'm going to be, once we're hiring, right? So we're both in, uh, we're both building different companies at the moment. But once we're hiring, I'm going to be talking about things which they won't get. So the quicker we get into this room so that Deborah can explain it because they won't understand it from me, the quicker we get in here, it's going to be much better. So I was sitting there thinking, I actually need to get them in here, them. I don't know who they are yet. We don't have them. They're imaginary still at the moment. But when they, are, when they are around, we'll get them in here and you'll, you'll explain them everything. So I'm very excited to get that to that stage. I love seeing that from you now because he was so bored in the first few meetings. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I, think, exactly. I think there's two things there. Um, the first thing is you just said the complete opposite earlier. Um, but anyway, it's fine because I'm in charge. But, <laughs> <laughs> but you said you probably wouldn't do it right from the start. And I actually would because... You know, I, would I meant, uh, sorry, I meant ideation when it's just me thinking about it. Okay. It'd be awkward yeah, for me you, to sit okay. with Deborah and we have all yeah. different name tags and it's just me. They all say Stuart <laughs> and I have to go sit in that seat and then be HR. Yeah. I mean, when yeah, you're yeah, the entrepreneur yeah. jumping off the cliff, yeah. there's no reason to have it because it's just me with the ideation. But then once you start bringing in people, yeah. immediately at that stage, they have to be on that journey. Yeah, so, so I intend to, to do here, it from, correct a, me. from a first employee. <laughs> but the second thing that I've been toying around with a lot, and this will probably surprise you because I haven't spoken to you about this, but is having a fully remote business um, because it's a tech business and I could possibly. Um, and I think EOS is something that lends itself really well to a remote or hybrid workforce. Mm. Um, and definitely, you know, it's from an accountability perspective, from a, a transparency and visibility perspective, I think it's a really good way to um, do it without killing the culture. And it's not this constant checking up and following up and where are you, what are you doing? Um, you know, you can sort of let people go do their thing as long as you've got this in place because this, this is the guardrails, right? Mm. Yeah. yeah. Brilliant. Gosh, I couldn't have asked for better people to talk about this. Could I? Thank you so much, guys. Really sure. appreciate you coming in. You'll stay around for a few minutes afterwards yeah, and show sure. people. But I'm going to You've got just... our bank account details, right? Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> we won't straight after the session, don't worry. <laughs>